After this video, you might say goodbye to Minikube because we are stepping up to install Kubernetes on a production level setup. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm Muhammad aka Mohido, and today it's Kubernetes time. And if you are still unsure if Kubernetes is right for your project, check out my video to Docker Compose Auto Kubernetes, link to Pride or in the description below. So, what's the game plan? Well, we need multiple machines. Whether they're actual servers or virtual servers, Kubernetes need at least two machines, two servers. One will play the boss, the manager node, and the other will handle deployed applications, will be the worker node. And these servers need to talk to each other, so they should be on the same network. According to the Kubernetes documentation, each server should have two CPUs and two gigs of RAM. My computer already has six cores and 16 RAM gigs, so I'll be using VirtualBox to create and manage virtual networks and virtual machines. I'm aiming for a small scale industry demo, so I'll use Rocky Linux. It's basically a Red Hat clone, but without the subscription fees. And to get Kubernetes running, we need to install some tools on our Rocky Linux virtual machines, which is inside VirtualBox, which is on my windows, which is on my desk, which is plugged to the wall. Uh, you, you, you get the picture. Now about the tools. First up is a container runtime. This is like the engine running our containers inside Kubernetes. If you're into game development, think of it as the core of your engine. If you are a full stack dev, it's your backend. And if you're a DevOps pro, well, um, shame on you if you don't know what a container runtime is. For this demo, I'll use Containerd because it's Docker's secret ingredient. When you install Docker, it actually installs Containerd under the hood. Next in the line, we have Kubelet, KubeADM, and KubeCTL. From their names, you can probably guess these are all about Kubernetes. Cube this, cube that, cube everything. Anyway, Kubelet is like an on-site manager on each server, keeping things running smoothly. Kube ADM is a setup wizard for Kubernetes. Without it, you'd do a lot of things the hard way, with lots of manual configurations. Finally, kubectl is just a command line tool that talks to Kubernetes and does what you tell it. Don't worry if this sounds hairy, we'll make it simple, I promise. And if you are enjoying it so far, don't forget to make my day by clicking here, there, and everywhere. First, download VirtualBox and Rocky Linux. I already have them on my computer, so let's get started by installing VirtualBox. Keep the defaults, click install. When it opens, let's create a common network. Go to Files, Tools, Network Manager, and under the NAT networks, create a new network, give it a cool name, and define the network's IP range, so it can handle more than 60,000 servers, because yeah, why not, and then click apply. Now, let's create a new virtual machine. Click new, give the computer a name, but please don't name it Zoidberg. Trust me. Since this will be the manager server, the controller server, let's call it Kubernetes Control 1. Choose Linux as a type and Red Hat as distribution because Rocky is a Red Hat clone. And increase the CPU count to 2, as per the talks of course, and let's use less storage instead of the default 20 gigabytes. After it is created, open its settings under Expert tab in Network section connected to the network that we just created. Just change the network type to NAT network and that will do it. Alright, the machine is ready, configured correctly, let's start it and install Rocky Linux on it. So choose the image, select the installation language, in the installation destination click the big icon twice and click done. For software, select minimal and hit done. In network settings, change the hostname to match the server's name, Kubernetes Control 1 in our case, and click apply. Set the root password and use the infamous root password. And of course, create a new user, give it admin access, and I called mine Mojito with password Mojito. Please do this for your production environment and share the IP of that environment in the comment. Last but not least, install the operating system. Now that our server is up, update the system packages. We need to enable IP4 forwarding. By default, this is set to 0, off, we'll switch it to 1, on, by creating a file in this says ctl.d directory. Two things to explain here. First, IP forwarding allowing the network traffic to pass through the server to other servers, exactly like your home router or waiter, whatever. Second, the sys ctl. This is a tool to edit kernel attributes, like network forwarding we spoke about earlier, or other operating system security settings. Any kernel parameter can be edited with this tool. 
So again, to change the IP forwarding parameter in the kernel through sysctl, create a file named kubernetes.conf. You can name it really anything. And the file should be located in the sysctl.d directory. Then set the IP forwarding parameter and run the sysctl with the system flag to update the kernel with the new parameter. Next, let's empower our introvert server with some networking skills. And we can do that by opening some holes, I mean ports, in the shy wall, I mean firewall. Otherwise, the server will not be accepting incoming traffic. And the Kubernetes documentation tell us which ports we should open for the manager and the worker nodes. So as the root user, use the firewall CMD to open the ports by putting them in the public zone permanently. Finally, reload the firewall with the firewall CMD reload flag. Otherwise, changes will not take place. Next, disabling the arch enemy of Kubernetes, the swap. Swap acts like a backup plan for memory, shifting extra stuff to the disk when the RAM gets heavy. And turning off swap is like separating water and oil. Kubernetes and swap just don't mix together. One's trying to orchestrate chaos and the other is like, yeah, I'm gonna mess with memory when you need it most, so we must separate them. And to check if your system has swap, print the contents of the swap file inside the process directory. Now disable it to the swap off command and to make it permanent, comment the swap line or delete the swap line in the fs tab file inside the atc directory. And if we check the swap again, we see that the swap is now gone for good. We are about to make something that might make the security experts out there cringe. Let's knock out the security guard, C Linux. For those who are new to this, C Linux or Security Enhanced Linux is like a system's bodyguard, keeping an eye on what applications and users can do. For example, your Snake game app shouldn't be really messing with important system files, right? And C Linux makes sure that it can't. So, why disabling it? It looks quite important. Well, it will save us some headache while focusing on the Kubernetes installation part. And is it even recommended to turn it off in a production environment? Absolutely, 100% nope. But don't worry, I'll cover C Linux in a separate video soon. Anyway, here is how to set C Linux to permissive mode or knocking it out. Use the command setenforce0 to disable it, temporarily of course. And to make this permanent, backup the C Linux configuration file located in the etc directory. Then edit that file to make the C Linux variable permissive. Now to the downloading and setting up containerd, the fun zone. Containerd has three main components the manager, containerd itself, the executor, run C, which starts and stops containers, the network plugin, CNI, which gives containers their social network skills. And of course, as always, we have to install all these components separately. Here's the plan. Let's grab containerd from GitHub using wget. The specific versions and all resources are in the description below. Feel free to use the latest version. Decompress the package using the tar command. Copy the files to the bin directory containing the binaries. Head over to the lib, systemd, systempath, and download the containerd service file. Two things to understand here. Service files tell your system how to start an application through the use of the systemctl tool. Systemctl is a tool on Linux that handles starting, stopping, and checking services. I mean applications. I mean services. I mean applications. Potato. 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 And after downloading, edit the containerd.service file to point to the correct location of the binaries, which is the bin folder to which we copied the binaries to earlier. And we can do that by changing the exec start variable to point to the new location. Update the systemctl using systemctl daemon reload and make the containerd startable automatically with the systemctl enable now containerd command. Install the run C. Download it through the link and install it using the install command. Then test it by typing its name, run C. Lastly, let's set up the CNI plugin. Create the folder, etc, cni, bin, then download and decompress the cni plugin files into it. Also, create a configuration directory named containerd in the etc folder. Generate the default containerd configurations and copy it there. Two things to edit in this file, set systemcgroup to true, 
telling the container D to let Linux manage the resources like CPU, memory, and storage through the use of the systemd. Two, upgrade the sandbox image, which is the container image used for initializing Kubernetes pods. Now restart container D and congratulate yourself because we are done through the boring part. Finally, the exciting part is here, installing Kubernetes. And we have to install three tools, kubelet, kubeadm, and kubectl. And to do that, create a new repository file called kubernetes.repo at yum.repo.d inside the etc folder, which allows us to install the trilogy using the yum package manager. And two things to understand here. First, a repository is like an online folder for software packages. Second, yum is a package manager on Rocky Linux. It's like the app store on your phone, but for servers. Back to the repo file. Add required data, give it a name, assign a repository URL, activate the repo, allow package verification, provide the verification URL of course, and exclude the packages from installing or updating. So during system updates, the Kubernetes tools will stay on the same version. Now we can install the three components using yum. And of course, don't forget to put the disable excludes flag to bypass the restrictions we said earlier. Last but not least, enable kubelet to start automatically. So, great news and bad news. The great news is that the control node is all set up. What's next? Well, the bad news. We have to do all of this again for the worker nodes, and it's a little bit tedious, so we'll speed run through it. 1. Create a new virtual machine for the worker node. 2. Install Rocky Linux, just like we did earlier. 3. Update the system packages. 4. Enable the IP forwarding kernel parameter and run the ESS control with the system flag. 5. Open the necessary firewall ports and reload the firewall. 6. Disable, swap permanently of course. 7. Set CLinux to permissive mode. 8. Download and install containerd, run C, and the CNI plugin. Don't forget to update the containerd configurations. 9. Add the Kubernetes repository, install the trilogy through yum and enable kubelet. Finally, we are done with the preparation part. And the fun is not over yet. Now comes the installation of Kubernetes. First, update the host files on both machines to link their IP addresses to their host names. So edit the hosts file inside the etc directory. And you can of course get the IP of the machine you're on by using the IP root command. On the control node, switch to the root user and run the kubeadm init command with the following parameters. First, the API server address with your control node's IP and the pod network with any network value for your pods. At this point of the video, I feel truly that this video is sponsored by two things to understand here, because we yet have another two things to understand here. One, the API server advertise address, always set it to your controls node IP, especially if there are multiple network interfaces. If unset, default interface is chosen. Regardless, it's always a good practice to just set it up. Two, the pod network CIDR. This is a network that your pods will be communicating through. You can choose any network at all, but make sure to make it large enough to host hundreds or thousands of pods. And I'll be using this network that you see in front of you because later in the future, we'll be installing, we'll be adding to Kubernetes some network plugins and these network plugins by default use this range. Now back to kubeadm. After the installation is done, exit from the root user and follow the steps printed on the screen to allow your user to access Kubernetes with kubectl. After doing that, run kubectl git pods with all namespaces to verify if things work correctly. Great, are we done now? Of course not, otherwise it will not be a video worth subscription. Anyway, see these two core DNS pods? They are actually crucial for networking, but they are not working, because Kubernetes by default does not set up networking. To fix this, we will add a network plugin to Kubernetes. Many plugins exist, but I chose to go with Weave plugin. It's simple, reliable, and can do basic networking between pods. To add Weave, it requires certain network modules to be loaded to the kernel. And with the sponsor of this video again, two things to understand here. One, the kernel is like the brain of your operating system. It's the core of your operating system. Two, the kernel has modules. These are additional functions you can plug into the kernel to extend its abilities. After loading the required modules using the mod probe command, the ones we need are the PR filter. IP tables, IP table filter, and IP table NAT. We can tell Kubernetes to apply the Weave plugin using the kubectl command. After a few minutes, everything should be working and running. If you reach this point, then congratulate yourself because as you can see, the control node is ready. Time to add the worker node to the cluster. Let's start by loading the same network modules that Weave requires. 
the ones we need are the BR filter, IP tables, IP table filter, and IP table mat. Then to add the worker node to the cluster, we can use a command generated earlier during the installation of the Kubernetes, or we can create a new one if we don't have access to that one. And we can create a new command by using the kubeadm token create print join command. Copy pasting commands in VirtualBox is a pain. So check if SSH is working on both nodes, then we can configure port forwarding in VirtualBox. Long story short, from our machine, we request localhost and some port. The VirtualBox listens on that port on our machine. The VirtualBox then forwards the request to the port on the virtual machine. Think of VirtualBox as a waiter moving traffic between your machine and the virtual machine. Welcome to the NAT networking concept. So to promote VirtualBox to a waiter, we need to go to the network settings and assign port forwarding settings or port forwarding rules. The guest IP and port are for the virtual machine and the host IP and port are for our computer. Once the networking is ready, SSH to the virtual machines and print the token on the controller, then copy it to the worker nodes. And after a few minutes, if we use the kubectl git nodes, we must see both nodes in a ready status. Five minutes later and... Yeah, something probably is wrong, right? Debugging truly took me forever and even now, I'm not exactly sure what caused the issue. But here is the gist of my troubleshooting, just in case you want to see me shamelessly recording myself doing scandalous Kubernetes stuff. 1. Describe the node and look for obvious problems. Yep, a node has sufficient resources and is invalid. Uselessly vague errors. Thanks. 2. Check kubelet logs on the worker node for anything useful. Oh, look, looks like a weave problem. 3. List all the pods. 4. Inspect the logs of the pod. Hmm, weave in it does not want to start. Okay, we're going somewhere. 5. Recheck kernel parameters. Yep, I know, I'm at this point questioning myself. 6. Ask AI, and it suggests setting specific bridge nf call bridge kernel parameter. Alright, let's try that parameter. 7. Check the logs of the weave in it. And it's complaining about missing modules. Wait, what? I, I, I already did that. Well, whatever, let's load the modules again. 9. Keep your fingers crossed and check the weave status again. Oh, no luck. Time for raging, crying, insulting, whatever, and then delete the problematic pod. 11. Kubernetes magically creates a working pod? Well, of course it does. And uh, there you have it. After all that, we've gotten ourselves a running cluster. Uh, just use Minikube, mate. Peace.